get started. Uh, my name's Kyle. I started iFixit. We're a online repair manual, but we're also pretty well known for our teardowns. Uh, we take apart all sorts of new gizmos when they come out and tell people how it works. Uh, can you guys all hear me okay? You good? Okay, awesome. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of info about iFixit and some of the things that we tear apart. And then I got Walter here. Walter, say hi. Hi. Can you? Do you have hi. a mic? <laughs> so, if you have questions as we go, go ahead and raise your hand and Walter can, can show. We've got a camera so you'll be able to see the disassembly as he goes. Uh, and we've got both the uh, brand new PlayStation Vita, which is the new uh, PlayStation Portable game device. As far as I know, this is the most graphics and horsepower you can pack into a handheld device. I don't think any of the, even the Android tablets come close to this. Uh, it's very impressive graphics wise. Actually, why don't you uh, power this on? And you can show us on the camera how fluid it is. One thing Apple has done really well on the iPad is all the graphics and animations on here are always 60 frames per second, so it feels really fluid. Where Android devices are jittery anywhere from 4 frames per second to 20 frames a second. I've never seen an Android device that was fluid. I'd like to, but I haven't seen one yet. But this thing is awesome. There you go. So go ahead and uh, pop into like some of the. So the entire front of it is a touch screen. And so you can see as I, as I browse through this, this, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's, it's laggier on that screen than it is. It's completely fluid on here. And I can go into, uh, like, what was their, where's their sample game? Is it up here? The welcome pack? I, I don't think this thing is running Android at all. I think this is a, their custom PlayStation operating system. And it's a pretty impressive effort that Sony's software team developed this, uh, and it's, it's far better than the software on any of the Sony Ericsson phones that you can get. I wish they would get their act together and collaborate, because this software is it's pretty dang cool. Where's the, the number counting here? So the run through the specs, and, and show you the, the hardware of this thing. So it's got a port there, headphone jack. Uh, on here we've got, this is the slot for putting games in, right? What's that slot called? What do they call their proprietary game format? No, this is the game, this card. Is the game card. And this is... Um, that's the that's, accessory dock. Yeah, okay, for, for additional accessories. And then they've got the buttons here on top. And you can see, I don't know if you can tell, the buttons are translucent plastic, which is a cute touch. And then here we've got, I have the 3G version here. So this is a SIM card slot with an AT&T SIM card. And I went through the process last night to just see if I could figure out how to get 3G access enabled. And on, on the iOS devices, it's pretty simple. You go through and you say, do you want to pay for AT&T $15 a month? And I say, yes, I want to give up my hard-earned money. And uh, they take my credit card, and I'm off to the races. And on this, once you got into AT&T's web interface for upgrading, uh, your, it was a mess. Like, it's got, I got to input my IMEI number. <laughs> and it's just not a, a intuitive interface at all. So, the PlayStation side of it is good, but they dump you onto the AT&T carrier web, web interface, and it's just abysmal. So I think Apple went and made a unique interface for every carrier to make it easy, and they put the extra effort in. And, and Sony decided that the um, interface stopped at their side of it. Oh, they don't like me removing the SIM card. No, they don't. Now, I was trying to, to play some, uh, download some apps before, and... We, did, we forgot at home, we forgot the little PlayStation Vita proprietary memory card. And you can't do anything on this without the proprietary memory card. Uh, it looks just like an SD card, but it's not a micro SD card, but it's not. And uh, the, the prices for them are what, two or three times the prices for a micro yeah, SD card? I think a four gig is. Four gig is 40 bucks. 30 bucks yeah. 32 gig is 100 bucks for a little micro SD card. And I will show you, I'll, let me bounce over to our, uh, our teardown real quick. And let's see. So the, our teardown, if you didn't see it at the time, this is on ifixit.com. Uh, hit the teardown link, and then you can browse through to find the PlayStation Vita. You pick out which of those cards uh, does not belong. One of those is not a micro SD card and costs much, much more. <laughs> yeah, right there. Uh, so Sony has always done this with their memory stick, and uh, I, I wouldn't expect anything differently from Sony. What's interesting is you remove uh, the card, and the device is worthless. You can't download any games. You can't even play the game that came on it. It has very little internal storage. It's all, it's all on that little external upgrade card. 
which I don't even know. Walter, let's say I have a game on my four gig card, and I decided to upgrade to a 32 gig card. Do I have to download all the games again? I think you could transfer them. It should have a transfer system. But how would you transfer? It's only got the one slot. I bet you'd have to download so, all the games cause, again. Cause Does anybody have one of these? Has anybody played with it? I don't it? have one. Yeah. Exactly. Not, not a whole lot of hardcore gamers. So what? The the role that that Sony is is positioning this is, the, you would think the competitor for this would be the Nintendo DS or the the 3DS, but really the competitor is the iPod Touch. That's what everybody is looking to in the gaming in the gaming world. You go to the Game Developer Conference, which is in San Francisco about a month ago, and everybody is developing for iOS now. And so Sony needs to develop a platform that will satisfy hardcore gamers. And the biggest issue with the iPod Touch is that you just have one touchpad interface. So that works if you want to use the accelerometer for a racing game, but if you want to play a sword fighting game or something, or Sonic the Hedgehog, some of the more traditional games that we're accustomed to on these, it's, it, it's much more challenging on the iPod Touch. So Sony said, we're going to build the ultimate input interface. And so this thing has, you've got your standard D-pad, you've got a joystick on the left, joystick on the right, you know, your standard uh, square X, triangle, circle interface, and then uh, buttons there. They've got volume power on top, and am I missing any buttons? Then there's, there's a PlayStation button here and your standard select and menu. So if you're used to it like an Xbox controller, this should feel right at home. Um, complete opposite perspective of Apple, which has the one button on the front of the iPod Touch and volume buttons. And it's an interesting gambit. They packed in a tremendous amount of horsepower into this, and I'll go into how they did that in a minute. Um, very, very interesting. The coolest part, though, is the back of it is actually a touch screen. So there's no display on the back, but when you're playing the games, you can use your fingers like this to control, control the game. So far more inputs packed onto this than you have fingers. I, I feel like this is designed for somebody with about 20 fingers. Have you, have you ever seen anybody play it with, like two, with two people? Like to, I have, yeah. Yeah, people, I've yeah. FIFA on that. FIFA with two people. And really nice game, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So t Walter, tell us a little bit about the gaming experience from your perspective. On this one, it was actually pretty great. Um, some games obviously don't utilize the back, but those that do, uh, for example, FIFA, uh, you don't you, you don't use the buttons anymore on the, in the front. It's just it's all flick, it's all just flick motions, and I think uh, it it's a unique design, which should give them some sort of uh, battle against Apple or Nintendo. <laughs> so quad core processor, uh, co uh, ARM Cortex A9. Quad core GPU, 512 megabytes of RAM, which is, which is interesting. Five, that's almost the limiting factor here. And I, I, they probably did that for cost and also to keep battery life. Uh, uh, battery life is, is, they claim, what, three to five hours for playing and, a game? between three to five hours if you're just playing a game. If you're and I have heard music, stories videos, of people, if you play it with the screen dimmed, you can get more like six or seven hours out of it. So uh, for, for an intense gaming session, that's a lot. But it's not like you're going to be able to play games solid on a flight. And the battery is not user replaceable like it's been in the past. They say it's not. <laughs> we'll <laughs> find out. <laughs> they say it's not. OK, so continuing onwards, you can see this is just photos of uh, what I showed you already. There's the touch screen on the back. Uh, all right. 3G card. All right, so Walter, why don't you just go ahead and start disassembling it? Sure. And uh, we'll see if he can disassemble as fast as I can scroll down this page. So uh, what he's using here, by the way, this is our, uh, our electronics uh, bit driver kit to disassemble this. This is a tool, uh, a set of tools that we make because nobody, we were really frustrated. We, we needed all the little tiny bits and torques and, and you know, triple zero Phillips that don't, uh, that you need to take apart this kind of stuff. And, and you can't often go down to Fry's and get all the, the tools that you need. So we made this and we update it a couple times a year with the latest bits that manufacturers use. So on the iPhone, Apple switched to using pr these proprietary five-point pendulobe screws on the bottom of it. And so we reverse engineered the screw head and got a manufacturer. And so the, the, the tool to disassemble the iPhone is in here. Uh, and we sell these online for about 25 bucks. So if you need to get inside stuff, I recommend that. We use it for all of our disassemblies. It's awesome. So I'm going to continue on. And then as, as he... Um, getting there. You're getting there. I'm getting there. How's this going? So, so we got screws along the bottom, along the side. While he does that, let me give you a bit more context on iFixit and show you some of the teardowns we've done in the past. And then we will uh, 
I'll, I'll check in with him periodically. So I started LifeXit uh, in the dorms in, at Cal Poly, and now we're about the biggest online repair destination. We're also one of the biggest teardown sites, and we are, we're really excited when new stuff comes out to take it apart and show you how it works, and how it's put together. Uh, I see somebody with a Cal Poly hat back there. I was at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. Uh, I, I, uh, my degree is in computer science, so I'm a hacker. I built our website. And uh, as you know, with software guys, uh, hardware people tend to distrust them. That distrust is probably well placed. So don't believe anything I say. And most assuredly, do not give me your phone, because it will not leave here intact. OK. We teach people how to fix all sorts of things. If you need to uh, repair the screen on your iPhone, we've got instructions that will show you step by step how to do it. As a matter of fact, I can show you on the app right here. That's that. Let's switch over to this one. OK, so I've got my phone here. And it's just plugged in so you can see our app. And uh, we've got the same teardown that I was showing you. It's available on the app. But I can also go in. And if I want to know how to disassemble something, like let's say I want to know how to take apart my iPad. We have step-by-step -step instructions, both on the website and on the app. And this can actually be downloaded offline. So you would, you're pretty, probably going to be off online when you're, when you're working on your iPad. But if you're replacing the spark plugs on your motorcycle, you might not be. So iFixit is a repair manual for everything. And we will show you how to get in and do just about any kind of repair imaginable. And if we don't have the repair you're looking for, uh, go ahead and do it anyway. Take some pictures and share it. We're a community. We have people all over the world sharing teaching us how to fix things, and then we teach everybody else. So all of these manuals have an edit button on them, and it's super easy to get in and make improvements. Now I'll go back to this teardown. Walter's pretty cocky. He doesn't think he needs the instructions. But I'll, I'll leave them here just in case you get stuck. So this is iFixit. We're building an online community of people teaching each other how to fix things. Our goal is to build a single online service manual, a Wikipedia of repair manuals, so that anyone can know how to fix all their stuff. Um, a lot of manufacturers think that's a great idea. Some manufacturers, uh, Apple, don't think it's a good idea. And so our community is particularly strong when it comes to Apple products. We have service manuals online that are all open source for basically every Apple product made in the last 15 years, including the new iPad or the iPad 2, 3, or whatever you want to call the slightly thicker, slightly heavier, slightly warmer new iPad. We have to, I'm just going to go through some of the teardowns we've done in the past that were kind of fun. This was the first can, uh, digital camera that had a Pico projector built in. It works really, really well if you're in a very pitch black room and you want a picture that's about that big. It's great for that. If you're in any other sort of environment, probably not, not that. Uh, useful. But what's cool is right here, this is the optical element they used. And they used the same element to take the pictures they did to project the pictures, same exact optics. So it was just fascinating from an engineering perspective how they packed it into the form factor of a little uh, point and shoot camera. The battery life was something like, what, 15 minutes of projection? Roughly. Yeah. So you, you can project for 15 minutes, and then you got to go and charge it for a couple hours. The Chumby, anyone know what Chumby is? If you're a hardware hacker, Chumbi is awesome because it's completely open source hardware. So uh, Bunny Wong, the guy that developed it, published all the circuit schematics online and how to get inside, including how to solder a new pin on, on the main board to output com composite video so you can go straight from the Chumbi out to your TV. Why would you want to connect the Chumbi to your TV, you say? What in the world is a Chumbi? The Chumbi is a 3 and a half inch touch screen, battery powered, internet connected alarm clock. It's awesome. And uh, they, they have a ton of widgets that you can make. So you can do custom software widgets. So we have a, a Chumbi on our desk with a picture of Shamu's, uh, a live stream of Shamu's uh, aquarium. Great. So we got the Shamu cam on our desk. And, and we play the Shamu drinking game. Every time Shamu swims past, you have to take a shot. This is Pleo. This is my favorite thing we've ever taken apart. He's a robot dinosaur. and. Uh, we almost cried when we took Pleo apart, because unlike most things like this PlayStation here, he's removing screws. The first step to disassembling Pleo is to bust out the scalpel. And so this is the inside of Pleo. Pleo has 12 microcontrollers, 9 motors, an incredible 360 degree action tail. Uh, his neck is uh, incredibly flexible. He has two cameras. He's got binaural hearing, so if you talk to him, he'll turn his head and look at you. He's triangulating your position in the room. Super cool toy. Uh, 
only catch with Plio was that he came in at a measly $300, which is a lot for a kid's toy. And so uh, Plio did not last. The company, that Ugobi, that made Plio burned through their venture capital, ran out of money, and they're not developing new products, unfortunately. But the manufacturer who they partnered with bought the rights to keep making Plio, and so you can still buy them. They're just not doing c continuing development. So if you're looking for little tiny motors and uh, pretty cool Atmel microcontrollers, this is a great device to buy and just disassemble for the parts to use in your own hacking projects. Uh, we have done a lot of teardowns recently. This is the Kindle Fire uh, that Amazon's re uh, released, and this is how to get inside a little bit. I'll just click through this quickly. Uh, the Amazon based their design off the BlackBerry Playbook design. We identify all the chips. This is using Samsung Flash. And at this point, Walter's got this a little bit disassembled, so I'm going to switch back over to the camera. So, Walter, tell me where you're at. I took apart the rear cover. All right, so, 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 so you got battery. a few screws off, and then you just there, removed how many screws to get at the battery? There were two screws and a bracket. That's it. So okay. the battery is something you can maybe do in 20 minutes? Less than that. I would okay. say five. And five what, what capacity is the battery? This one was, I think it was 1750. No, actually, 2210. So this is a, a pretty big battery. Yeah. And that, you know, that's how they're, they're packing the, the five hours of battery life. One thing that's useful about how easy to disassemble and get the battery this is, is one, your, your, play, your Vita isn't going to be toast in a couple years when you burn through the 500 cycles this battery is going to last. You can just disassemble it, swap in a new battery. But also it's important, when you think about designing products, you got to think about design for end of life. And the poor electronics recyclers that have conveyor belts of hardware going past and they have to disassemble things and yank the batteries out fast, uh, they will thank you. And you wonder, well, why do they have to remove the battery as part of the recycling process? It's because they pull out all the plastic in the circuits, and then they run the plastics through a shredder. And if they miss a battery and the battery runs through the shredder, it... Anyone know what a battery does when you run it through a shredder? It explodes, yes, in a fiery boom. And uh, they told me that they're used to batteries exploding every once in a while, but if it starts happening more often, it starts causing health and safety issues. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love a job where explosions are just sort of a normal course of operation. The guys that run the recycling plants at companies like Electronics Recyclers International and Sims Recycling are super, super bright, cool guys, but they have to deal with what we give them. And so please, as you have a chance to design the product, be nice to the poor recyclers who are going to be dealing with your products five, ten years from now. All right, so now that you're inside, tell me a bit about what we're seeing here. So this here's the wireless card right here. So that this is the uh, oh, 3G right card. And do you remember who makes the components on that? I'll, I'll pull up the slide here in a minute. It was Theros, I think? Let's I'm see. It was right there. I'm going to skip. Oh, this is, oh, that's a different product. That's why that there didn't look familiar. All right. <laughs> this product. Here we go. Wireless card. OK. So here's the wireless card. So they're using Avago uh, power amplifiers and a Qualcomm power manager. And uh, then the, the Qualcomm. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Here, let me go to this one. There you go. So we've got uh, Qualcomm Power Management, Avago uh, Power Amplifiers, a bunch of them. And then the, the brains of it is a Qualcomm MDM 6200, which I don't think I have uh, Wi-Fi. But I'll see if it works, and I can pull up the spec sheet on that. And then uh, a little bit of, of Toshiba SD RAM. One thing that's kind of nice for us, we're used to taking apart Apple products. And if any of you, and I won't, I won't ask who, but I would assume that some of you here have designed products that have ended up in an Apple device. And one thing that Apple very regularly does is tells the manufacturers, the semiconductor manufacturers, you cannot put your own branding on the outside of your chip. Which is a little bit mean, I think, as an engineer that I want to show off what I make. But that's, that's how Apple stands. Uh, and so we, we take apart an Apple device, and a lot of times we'll see Apple logos, and we're like, there's no way Apple did that. And it turns out it's a Sirius Logic audio controller. And I feel a little bad for the Sirius Logic guys. We try to go inside the chips. We'll dis dissect them when we can and let you know who makes them. Uh, in the case of a, a Sony device, though, everything is very nicely labeled. And so it's much faster for us to identify parts inside of non-Apple products. We have to go a bit above and beyond when we're taking apart something like the iPad to identify all the components. 
as you're seeing Walter work here, you might be laughing a little bit about how many disconnect connectors he's disconnecting. Uh, One, this two, is a three, little bit of what adds to the thickness of the device. Four, yeah, let's five. switch over to the camera. <laughs> he's counting them. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are about 10, I think, around there. Yeah. About 10 connectors, if I remember. So disconnect all the connectors. If you've taken apart your, your device and you put it back together and it doesn't work, odds are you, that one of the connectors you didn't seat all the way. So you got to take it apart and check all the connectors. And I'm usually taking it apart, putting it back together. Whenever we get support calls, people say, I took apart my laptop and replaced the PMU board, put it all back together, and now it doesn't turn on. I hate you. You sold me a bad part. We always say, well, hold on, take a step back, take it apart, disconnect all the connectors, put them back in, and I swear 95% of the time that fixes the issue. These connectors are super tiny. It's hard to get them to know exactly when it's seated in there. And so unless you've got about 1,000 hours of experience working in the Foxconn factory inserting connectors every day, uh, uh, you're probably not going to be quite um, consistent at, at inserting them. So continuing on, the, it's got a little VGA camera. Here it is. Uh, when I say VGA camera, I actually mean VGA. It's 640 by 480. That's a little sad, but you're not doing much with the camera. They've got some cute little games. So you can take a picture of your toys, and then it mixes them up, and then you've got like a puzzle, you know, rearrange the tiles game. Um, have you seen any other clever uses of the camera on this? Mm, I think AR. I think they have augmented reality. Are, are they doing? Uh, I think they okay. have that. Yeah, yeah. I did because we were playing. We saw the Star Trek game or the Star Wars game, and you could shoot uh, lasers. Um, you know, you could battle somebody in front of you with the lasers. Sure. Their attempt at augmented reality, I think, is a little bit underwhelming. It's far more impressive to see what what Nintendo is doing with the 3DS because they've got 3D, they've got dual cameras, and they're doing some more interesting interactive elements. Uh, Nintendo sort of bet the farm with the 3DS on on 3D technology and and and, and on the augmented reality. And Sony is going more for a high-powered uh, ultimate gaming machine. So continuing onwards, the touchscreen controllers in Atmel MXT224. Anybody here work for Atmel? No? All right. We, we, won't, we won't give them a, a free advertisement then. All right. I'm going to let Walter keep going, and we will go back to, uh, let's see. I want to show you in, uh, a little bit more inside the, these are just some more photos from the Kindle Fire. And you can see similar touchscreen. This is a, not an Atmel uh, controller on the, on the uh, Kindle Fire. It's Illitech. This is the entire disassembled fire. And I'm showing you the fire, and then this is the, the Barnes & Noble Nook. So when, when I show you the iPad, you, you have a bit of context for comparing them. Uh, one thing that really differentiates the Nook is that right here, it's got a removable micro SD slot. And so unlike an iPad where you buy a 16 gigabyte version, and then you realize that when Apple updated the new iPad, to Retina Graphics, all of a sudden all your app file sizes doubled because everybody had to include twice the images inside their apps. Your 16 gigabytes don't go near as far as it used to. And with the Barnes & Noble device, you've got the opportunity to upgrade, um, you know, upgrade the storage. Now, I thought it was funny. I went to Barnes & Noble's sales page for the Nook, and this was their sales page very much saying, buy your Steve Jobs book on your Nook. This is the thickness of the Nook versus the Fire. Uh, if I were to compare the, the iPad in there, it would be a little bit thinner than the Nook. Uh, getting in there, uh, pretty straightforward here to get at the battery. This is the craziest circuit board I've ever seen in my life. They, they designed the circuit board like a picture frame so the display could sit inside it. That was a, a you're trying to make the device as thin as possible. And so they said, well, we could do this. Why the heck not? Apple's perspective would be, well, we can just cram everything on the right side, and so we'll just make a super tiny board. Barnes & Noble wasn't quite that ambitious. Here's the display. Uh, they got the display, uh, the glass manufacturers, to cut a, uh, a notch off the side of the normally square L LCD front. I thought that was kind of fun. And LG display there. OK, so that is inside the, the fire and the nook. Now let me go back over, and we'll check in with Walter and see how he's doing. OK, so you have the logic board right here. Then you have the, I think it's the left, the left button board right there. 
And this should be the three G's. No, that's the game. This card. is the this is the game card right slot. There, okay, yeah. gotcha. Then you have your camera right over here. And now that's the rear facing camera. There's also a front facing camera, front right? Front facing camera was Where is you it lost at? it. It's it's it goes right I there. I lost it. Where'd it go, Walter? I lost it. We were playing with it last night, so it was in here before you started taking it apart. Maybe they. Uh... Nope, it's right there. Okay. Right. <laughs> I guess I lost it. Great. That's not coming out of my paycheck, all right? <laughs> no, of course not. No. All right. So uh, one thing I thought was kind of fun. Talk about these screws. You should show oh, off these the little... uh, boy girl party screws. Yeah. yeah. So in in our teardown, where, where do we where do we have that? Oh, here. So. So as he arranges the screws, I'll, I'll show you here because it's a bit of a better picture. Uh, we, we don't see pretty screws like this very often. And so uh, uh, we, we said in our teardown that it was like a boy-girl screw party. And uh, did, did, were they using the color code, different components inside? Yeah, so the blue ones are for the logic board, and the pink ones hold down, I think it was the, uh, the SIM board, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Okay. So kind of, they're, they're must, but they're the same length, right? Uh, no, these are a little short. So what I would guess, and I, I would have to look at this a bit more, but I would guess that they, they wanted to differentiate the lengths because I would bet if you insert the blue screws in a slot where a pink screw goes, you're probably going to short something out. Uh, and you try to design things to where if somebody disassembling it, putting it back together, puts the wrong screw in the wrong slot, it doesn't you know, short two boards together. But if you can't avoid it, I guess this is, this is a reasonable way to try to get the message across. Hey, these screws are different lengths. When we do our disassemblies, we always annotate how long the screws are so that if you're following the procedure, you can always use, mess up some calipers, measure the screws, and make sure that you're on track. So continuing further on, and I'll let Walter keep disassembling it, I wanted to, to point out the processor. This, uh, the processor here, and if I can zoom in. So Sony Computer Entertainment, and this is a, uh, their part number, a CXD5315GG. Um, this is proprietary Sony technology. Sony has always prided themselves on doing custom. They did the, the cell processors in the PlayStation 3. And they're continuing the route of proprietary, super high-end, integrated hardware graphics. And the only other company out there really doing that is Apple. And it's certainly a winning strategy for Apple. If Sony uh, is successful with this product, they'll be able to hit scale uh, with the processor. And it could lead to very interesting things. It's the hardcore, very high performance, integrated graphics and, uh, and, G and CPU that is allowing Sony to get the five hours of battery life out of this. What's interesting, this thing has, I haven't seen the numbers, but I, I would bet it's 10x the performance of the, the graphics and the CPU in the Nintendo 3DS, and yet they have the same battery life. And they're able to accomplish that with a bigger device, bigger battery. Uh, but I, Sony is about the only company out there doing this sort of thing outside of Apple. So you would think if anybody could give Apple a run for their money in the Android and the phone market, it would be Sony. And yet I see sort of a schizophrenia between what I would say is frankly fairly shitty Android devices and pretty dang elegant hardware here with incredible graphics performance, super fluid interface. And I would love to see all that brought together in, in a form factor that was more accessible to people. Because if, like, am I gonna, am I gonna lose anything if I pick this up? No, all right, really. so this, this is too big to fit in my pocket. This is not the sort of device I'm just gonna, you know, slip in my shirt pocket and go. And as a matter of fact, do you have the case that it came in? It's down here. They ship it with this handy carrying case. So they know this isn't a pocket-sized device. They're going for a hardcore gaming device. And you know, more power to them. And I, I hope they're successful in, in the gaming world. The challenge they've got is that they're, they're competing against an app store with a couple hundred thousand apps, a hundred thousand games. And Sony has some compelling launch titles, but, but at most they're going to have a few dozen games. And, so it, and the games are going to be much more expensive, you know, $40, $50 for a game versus $2. Or how much is Angry Birds Space? Free. <laughs> Free. So, <laughs> and Angry Birds Space has what? I mean, they hit like 10 million downloads in the first few they days. Did. Yeah. yeah. So, and th this does not have Angry Birds. It has better games, but it doesn't have Angry Birds. Yeah. You mean, how, how is what Sony's doing here different than what Samsung is doing? Well, Samsung is using more off-the-shelf ARM designs. And uh, this is a, you know, custom quad-core. I haven't, it has, 
Samsung might have on the tablets, but I don't think they've shipped any quad-core phones. Am I wrong? I, I, and, and so they're pushing the envelope a bit there. They're able to get away with it because it's a larger phone factor. But what I think is interesting, Samsung is throwing tons of marketing behind the Galaxy Note, uh, which is big and awkward. And I don't see a compelling reason to have the Galaxy Note over something like this. So I think Samsung's got kind of an odd, misshapen, badly targeted product with the Galaxy Note. It's also very expensive. It's something like $600 out of contract, $300 under contract. This thing starts at $250 for the Wi-Fi version, $300 for 3G. So if I didn't want to live in the world of Apple, which I could completely understand, people having that perspective, I would look at something like this, even as a PDA or a mobile internet device, it's got a WebKit browser on here. I would totally pick this over the Galaxy Note any day of the week. Um, I think the performance on this seems far better to me than, than the performance I see on the Galaxy Note. So uh, he's got it completely disassembled. Let me just go back over and we can try panning the camera and show you. Can I lift it up? You do this sort of a, no? There, ish. That's about everything there. Um, and you can see, I think it's really fun to see the hardware on like these little buttons. You can sort of see the button here. Uh, this, is, this is the sort of cool stuff you get to make if you're a hardware designer for a game company, where Apple probably doesn't need as many mechanical engineers to work on the iPhone. Uh, this button is super cool and, and, and feels very rugged and sturdy. But it does add up to a thick, uh, you know, you got a mechanical joystick. Of course, it's going to be, be pretty thick. But a very cool device. Um, I'm just going to skim through the rest of the pictures, and then I promise I'd show you the iPad. So this here, this is, this is our complete teardown shot. Every device we take apart, we give a repairability score. This is, for an engineer, it's, it's, it's a bit of a hackability score, how easy it's going to be to get in and tweak. But it also really impacts your choice as a consumer. If you want to buy one for your kid, is it something where when he drops it on the sidewalk, you're going to be out 250 bucks, or you're going to be able to buy a new screen for 40 or 50 bucks and fix it? And we gave uh, the PS Vita a very high repairability score of 8 out of 10. As you can see, it didn't take Walter any time at all to get inside this. In a bit of foreshadowing, I will tell you, we came for this talk with an iPad 3, or new iPad, however you want to talk about it, and we spent two hours disassembling it before the talk because I wanted to be able to show you the inside, and there's no way we would have been able to get inside an iPad 3 if we had taken the entire 45 minutes to do it. So without further ado, uh, can we you know, move so some of that move? out of the way and let's, let's sure. move on to the iPad. <laughs> Any questions about the PS Vita before we start showing you inside the iPad? An Dude. hour. An hour. an hour to put it back. And Walter will put this back together when we're done. You give me whiskey? He's... Half an hour. <laughs> Even better. Oh. Walter's no whiskey, done this a few then. times. Vodka. We were playing with it last night, and this has been disassembled a couple times already. So we're, we're very successfully disassembling, reassembling the, the PS Vita oh, and having it functional at the end of it. it we're much less successful with the new iPad. Let me show you our, our iPad teardown. This is getting inside. Now, one thing... If you follow iFixit, you might be familiar. We take new hardware releases very, very seriously. It's critically important to me that we're the first people in the world to get our hands on the inside of the new iPad. And so we will do whatever we have to do to get a new device first. If that means going to the Apple store and lining up two days ahead of time, we'll do it. A few years ago, we found an interesting technique. We realized Apple likes to do these day and date releases where the iPad uh, 3 or the new iPad came out on Friday morning at 8 a.m. everywhere, including other countries like Japan and Australia, which are a fair ways ahead of us. They're on the other side of the dateline. So we flew to Melbourne, Australia, to get our hands on the new iPad. And this is uh, Mac Fix at Australia, who was friendly enough to give us access to their lab so we could, we could disassemble it. And uh, Luke, my business partner, flew, got in line, waited in line overnight. They had a midnight launch in Melbourne. And so we actually had our teardown online at 8 AM on Thursday, a full 24 hours before the product release here in the US. This is our tools to disassemble the iPad. The Red Bull is critically important at 2 AM in Australia. Um, 4G LTE does not work when your iPad is upside down, evidently, because Apple doesn't support the LTE frequencies in Australia. 
Uh, and there's actually a lawsuit I saw today. Uh, the, uh, the Australian government is suing Apple for advertising as a 4G iPad, even though it doesn't work on Telstra's LTE frequencies. And that's purely Apple just decided they weren't going to support as many wireless uh, frequencies. They primarily are targeting 4G LTE at the US market. But they're still selling them in other markets. And if you have an LTE iPad in Australia, it, you, it just works at 3G speeds. All right, so step one to get inside the iPad. Get a 1500 watt industrial strength heat gun. And the reason is that all around the edge, they've glued the glass to the, the frame of the iPad. And so the technique, and let me tell you, we have this, this is the same design as the iPad 2, and we've been doing this over and over. We, we've disassembled about 10 iPad 2s. And what we have found is this is the way you do it. You gotta heat up the outside evenly, and then as you go, you use suction cups to lift it up a little bit and you wedge guitar picks in and work your way around slowly. It takes us about an hour. I think we timed you an hour, hour, 15 minutes to get the touchscreen digitizer off. And around the edge, you can sort of see if I hold it just right, the adhesive all the way around the edge. The challenge is you're heating it up to about 250 degrees, but there's a, there's a little plastic home button here and the plastic home button melts at 250 degrees. So you got to heat everything else up and, and heat it more slowly around here, but there's still adhesive all around the home button. So this is clearly not a device that is designed to ever be disassembled, ever. This is something, it's super fast to manufacture, slap all the components together, put a little glue, slap it together, uh, and it's working well for them on keeping manufacturing costs down. But it's a disaster when it comes to service. And, and if any of you have, have broken your iPad, uh, you know you've kind of got a problem on your hands. The battery in the iPad lasts about a thousand cycles. After that, it's done. Kaput, throw your iPad away, buy a new one. And that's the way Apple likes it. That's probably the way all of us in the semiconductor industry like it, because we sell more chips when they're buying new iPads. The problem is the environmental impact of throwing away iPads after a couple years and, and building new ones. So uh, I'm gonna show you here that the, the exciting bit about the iPad is the new display, super thin, uh, 2048 by 1536 pixels, is that right? And uh, super, super interesting display technology. I don't have time now to talk about how they did the manufacturing. That's a whole nother talk. Uh, Apple went to Sharp and LG and Samsung and asked them to make new displays uh, based on some technology from Sharp. They told them the, the timeline they'd need the millions of units by, and Samsung was the only one able to deliver, as far as we can tell. All the iPads we've disassembled have only had Samsung displays in them. So Samsung is the only one that was able to ramp up manufacturing capacity in time. This is a Samsung display, and this is absolutely world-leading technology. Nobody else is doing this, including Samsung in their own tablets. Does anyone work with Samsung here? Nobody, nobody will admit it. Nobody wants to say. I would love to know the internal dialogue between the Galaxy Pad team that would love the awesome new display and Samsung Display Corp, who says, look, Apple gave us $2 billion to build a new factory. What are you going to do? That, that had to have been a fascinating meeting. Okay, so here's the, the uh, logic board out. And you can see, compared to the, the uh, main board in the uh, Barnes & Noble Nook, this is a far more compact design. Part of the way Apple's able to achieve the compact design is they're putting the GPU on, on the CPU die. Uh, it's a much larger die size than we've seen in the past. Uh, Semiconductor Insights posted some uh, design uh, die photos, you can go online to their website and, and check it out. <coughs> One thing, as a result of going to a GPU, well, to a larger GPU, it's a quad-core GPU, same CPU performance, dual-core CPU, uh, based off an ARM design, but you know, proprietary to Apple, the A5X, they, they were putting out more heat, so they had to move the RAM, which had been stacked on top of the processor, they moved the RAM uh, separately, and it's on the other side of the board here, and this was, was it Toshiba RAM? Yeah, and let me uh, go through some, some more down. photos just so you can see it. This is the process of getting inside industrial strength suction cups lifted off. You have to be careful with the suction cups though because there's connectors as you go. Um, continuing onwards. By the way, if you need any of the tools for disassembling it, these are some of the parts and tools that we sell at iFixit. Continuing onwards, getting inside.
So these are, are some of the, the components identified. The, uh, the Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth part is a Broadcom BCM 4330. And uh, L oh, LP the DRAM in one of the units we took apart. But I, I think we saw Toshiba DRAM in one of the other devices. So Apple's multi-sourcing that. And then a lot of Broadcom parts. Um, again, this an Apple-branded Sirius Logic Audio codec that I was talking about earlier. And then here is the, the 3G board. And Qualcomm is the big bit winner here with the RT80, RTR 8600 uh, multiband LTE chipset. And what's interesting is Qualcomm has a newer, lower power LTE world band chipset available. Apple didn't use it. And I would love to know why. I, I, would, I would speculate maybe uh, Qualcomm wasn't ready in time for Apple's rigorous design review process. Or maybe Apple was concerned that Qualcomm wouldn't be able to hit the yields that they needed on it. Or it could have been a cost decision. So rather than going with a lower power Qualcomm chipset, Apple just went with a bigger battery. The battery in the iPad 3, and you've got it here? Right there. The battery is, uh, and I'll skip past this and show off the battery once you get inside, huge, massive, massive battery. This, this thing, 70% bigger than the previous battery. <laughs> Uh, and so when, when everybody is talking about the new iPad running a little bit warmer, it's running warmer because they're dissipating 70% more watts in the same space of time. It, it's, it's got a 10-hour battery life. Uh, they're, they're dissipating 70% more power, and all that power is going to heat. Uh, Consumer Reports is flipping out about this. Um, I think Consumer Reports is crazy. It just runs a little bit warmer. It doesn't run hot. My laptop runs hotter than the iPad, so that's completely overblown. But... Uh, it is interesting that Apple made the decision to go with a slightly thicker, heavier device, throw a much bigger battery in it, and uh, Apple's going to see, be able to, they've got a lot of, of leeway now, because it, the, I, the new iPad is pull, drawing a lot more power than previous iPads have. Bigger graphics, uh, slightly inefficient wireless chipset, and so they're going to have a lot of room to reduce that power consumption in the future, which means they could get a substantially larger battery life with the next version, or they could go with a much thinner device. I'm just going to skip to the end of this, this analysis. We gave the iPad 3 one of the lowest repairability scores we've ever given any device. We gave it a 2 out of 10. It's devastatingly difficult to take apart. It can be done by a qualified service technician or someone who's very familiar with iFixit service manuals and has done it before, but it's not something we can recommend consumers do. So I would like to give a big shake of my finger to the Apple uh, designers that, that came up with this design. It's a horrible design for the environment. It's a horrible design for consumers, and we're really not happy about it. Uh, it's going to cause people to have to replace their iPads every, every two, three, four years, rather than what we've seen with computers, where computers last a lot longer. All the circuitry, all the semiconductor components inside this device will last for 10 or 20 years, but they baked a consumable in there. Apple baking the battery into this device is just like HP selling a printer with an ink cartridge that is welded in there or a car with, with tires that you can't replace the tires, you just you wear out the tires, you buy a new car. You know Honda would love to do that. They would sell a lot more cars if you had to buy a new car every time you wear out the tires. But it's absolutely silly. Batteries wear out, it's effective physics. The rest of the device shouldn't wear out, it should be easy to get in there and, and uh, work on it. And so that's part of what we're doing at iFixit, is we're trying to raise awareness for these kinds of issues and let people know what's involved how difficult it is to work on these things, and build an online community. We want all, all of us tinkers, you know, all of us got into engineering because we were excited about taking things apart and learning how they work. And that's what I fix it is. It's a community of people who are banding together and saying, we're going to teach each other how to fix stuff because we're excited about it and because we want to make our things last longer. So if you're interested at all, check out ifixit.com. Uh, join our newsletter. Get more involved. And... Uh, we would love to, to talk to you guys. Uh, we, are, we have a, a PlayStation Vita to give away. So if you haven't put your uh, business card in the fishbowl in the back, where's the fishbowl at? Here. OK, put your business card in there real quick, and then we'll do a drawing. Should I put my card in there? Yeah. <laughs> Walter, you're not eligible to win. Come on. Any questions real quick while people put their, their business card in there? Over there, you got a question over there. What, what repairability score? Can you look on the app? I don't remember. Yeah, sure. uh, did you do the disassembly on that one? The uh, Galaxy, the Galaxy Nexus? Nexus? Yes, I did. Uh, I think we gave it a six. So it was about middle of the road. It was uh, not a user replaceable battery, as I recall. Uh oh, you just uh, crashed my phone. All right, well.
Get an uh, Android phone. Go on, I fix it. And, yeah. Oh, you know what? We ran the battery out is what we did because we were running. Yeah. I think it draws more power when it's hooked up to the display. It's so, really uh, the, yeah, this is, it's warm. Warmer than the iPad 3. Uh, so check out ifixit.com slash teardown on all the devices. When we do the teardown, we post the repairability score at the bottom. We also put out press releases and information when we do the, the repairability ratings. Because absolutely, that's something you need to know. And it's something that the electronics review sites don't tell you. We're about the only one that do. Any other business cards or anything? Yeah. Is there a way to really to cycle the battery to bring it back to life? Or that's like you, you pretty much just need to replace the battery. So you've got to get a replacement battery, put it in there. There isn't really any conditioning you can do. It's just physics. Lithium-ion batteries wear out. He's asking if it's, if it's better to uh, completely run the battery out or you know, just use it a little bit. It's not like the batteries of your, like the lead acid batteries where you had to condition them. Lithium ion batteries are pretty good. You can pretty much do whatever you want. The only thing, if you're storing it long term, if you know you're not going to be using it for a month or so, you want to leave it about two thirds charged. But aside from that, it, it really doesn't matter. S cycling it all the way, you know, completely discharging it and charging it back up can recalibrate the chip inside so that it reflects how much charge it has more accurately. But that's about it. There's nothing really you can do. It's, it's fairly bulletproof as long as it lasts. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Oh, there is, yeah. You can put it back together. You just have to re-glue it. Uh, and so we're doing that internally. I mean, we've taken apart the iPads, put them back together. We gave it a 2 out of 10. It is repairable if you really know what you're doing. It's just difficult. But like Kyle said, it, takes, it took me about an hour and a half to get in there. To just get it apart. And just then it'd be another you know, half an hour, an hour to put it back and together. And this is being careful without yeah. cracking the display. Yeah. Otherwise, well, I could just... One thing, yeah, by the way, the difficulty oh, of getting yeah. inside is getting past the glass. If you dropped your iPad and broke the glass, it's actually much easier to get inside because the glass yeah. is already broken. <laughs> so it is. Uh, if you're not, you know, one thing we've been thinking about doing is selling repair kits for the iPad that just include new glass, figuring if you're going to replace the battery, just replace the glass and the battery, and then it's, it's much less of a big deal. Yeah. Yes? Uh, we do. We sell them on our site. How susceptible when you're working on them? Yeah, when, you, when you're working on a device, in this case, we didn't care that much, but we recommend people ground themselves out with the SD. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, you can wear the fancy wrist strap. We sell this, uh, we sell a little toolkit here. This is six, uh, 70 bucks. For that 70 includes bucks. all the tools you need to work on, on uh, hardware. It includes a bunch of uh, tools and um, oh, plastic and metal pry tools. And included in here, we include an ESD grounding strap. So we do recommend people be careful. At the same time, um, this stuff is fairly robust. We don't see that many issues caused by ESD, surprisingly, considering how sensitive we know it all is. The ceramic coatings they use on the outside of the chip do a pretty good job of, of insulating them. Anybody, last chance, get your business card in there, and then we'll draw to win a awesome PS Vita, uh, PlayStation Vita. This, thing, this is the Wi-Fi version, which is fine, because you don't want to go through AT&T's horrible screen to sign up for cellular coverage anyway. Uh, it has 3G, you can browse the internet on it, but it does not work as a phone, which is good for you because you do not want so, uh, the opposite sex seeing you in a bar talking on a PS Vita. It would be a very embarrassing experience. It'll be just like the N-Gage, Can you imagine? Right? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. It's like the Nokia N-Gage. I, I remember that one. Yeah. The, the N-Gage, and, and that sold exactly three units? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sony gets gaming. They, they, they really built a solid, rugged gaming device. The question we all have is, is, is it going to matter? OK, thank you, Aaron. All right, so toss that in there. I'll shut this. OK. All right, and the winner of the PS Vita works for Orbital Sciences as a program manager. Their cellular telephone number is no, Aaron Martin. They're in here? All right. Oh. Congratulations, Aaron. For, well done. For the rest of you, I'll, I'll stick around a little while if you want to talk to me. Uh, check out ifixit.com. Uh, our teardowns have lots of interesting information, and we're putting out new repair manuals all the time. Thank you very much.